Thank you for listening to the Tatnus Podcast on the Tatnus Co. Network. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. A Mercedes kind of sentiment, luxury, and trust in me to honor the free we all should be. It sees my sons out burst into yin and yang, right? And that's me. And- What's up, y'all? Welcome to the Tatnus Podcast. My guest today is awesome. Uh, if you like Pink Floyd, you're going to love this guest. He is none other than Scott Page of Pink Floyd and Super Tramp and many other uh, accomplishments along the way. He's currently working with um, my past guest now, good friend now, um, Kenny Olson from Kid Rock, Twisted Brown Trucker, and uh, another guest that I've had recently that will be released down the road, uh, Stephen Perkins of Jane's Addiction, played with Nine Inch Nails and all that. They actually have a thing going on right now, Think EXP, and uh, I'll be attending that this December in Montreal, and I'll be signing autographs, and there will be a few copies of the documentary to give away, and all that cool shit, and fans will be able to hang with me for the day. Uh, And then I'll be hanging with Kenny and Scott and Steven later on, so that'll be cool. Uh, If you can make it out to Montreal, check that out. Come say hi. Do not hesitate. Um, This show was really cool because I got to talk to a member of Pink Floyd about consciousness and shrooms, so that was kind of cool. And then, uh, you know, he ends up uh, going from, hey, you're a fighter, to... uh, why not be the bodyguard for us in Montreal? <laughs> it's just funny. Taking the piss a little bit, but uh, at the same time, it's like, well, you never know, right? Uh, it would be cool. Um, but you got to check this show out. We talk about a, a bit of everything on this one, like shrooms and deep consciousness and entrepreneurship and just kind of the way the game is changing in terms of business and how we do business because of technology. It, it's so cool that uh, he's into so much of this and... Really knows his stuff, so check it out, man. All right, so how well, are nice you? Nice to meet you. Hey, you too, man. Well, it's an honor, actually. It's, uh, now that we got all the technical stuff out of the way, I'm yeah. not technologically inclined as a Mennonite, so I'll be the first to admit that. <laughs> it's worse for me. I've owned tech technology companies for years, and man, if I don't have an IT guy, I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have my producer with me who usually takes care of all these things. So That's right. And uh, I sent the email like three times and it didn't go apparently. And I was like, really, what is going on? I just got through talking to Kenny Olson. Uh, Okay. Yeah, man. Uh, You know, typically my show is about an hour and I always make it known to people. If they don't have that kind of time, that's great. I could fill in. Him and I ended up talking for about two hours, just over two hours. Like, just you know what I mean? Uh, Lost track of time. And he, he had pulled over. He was on this, you know, in a church parking lot. (laughs) <laughs> on his way to a gig and he pulled over to do the show and uh i said man here i am keeping you and he's like no nah, it was awesome he's like i you know i wanted to do it so <laughs> it's right, great great so is the volume good on my mic do i sound Beautiful. clear yeah okay perfect. good all right excellent let's rock absolutely man you gotta have stories coming at the wazoo i would imagine with all your career it's so lengthy and just extensive I had some. I got some stories. I don't know if I can talk about them here, but oh, you know, it's an uncensored show. So I mean, as long as they ain't gonna oh, get too many legal trouble. <laughs> there is a there is a there is a code of ethics amongst the musicians. That is a good point. Yeah, good point. <laughs> That's just crazy, man. The uh, the extensive amount of work you've done is just mind blowing. It's like my God, that is cool. It's, it's had to be like fulfilling. I'm sure of it. Oh, it's been, you know, it's a great ride. I mean, there's no question. I, I look back now and it's like, holy crap, that actually all happened. It's like strange. <laughs> you know, it's so different when you're actually there doing it, right? It's right. It's cool. You know, obviously you're loving it and it's enjoyable, but you know, sometimes you don't realize the certain significance of things at the time. You know, it's like, yeah. you know, it's like interesting when I grew, was growing up, my father, um, you know, he was a musician also, and he, he was actually one of the inventors of the wah-wah pedal. Oh, the wow. famous guitar pedal, right? And so I remember my dad coming, coming home and bringing the first wah-wah pedal to, my, to the house. It was this little organ pedal with a potentiometer and stuff that they worked, they built over it 
Thomas Oregon Company with him and Brad Plunkett was the actual engineer. My dad and him was the guy that put it together. If you remember, the original Wawa pedal was called the Clyde McCoy Wawa pedal. Wow. And that was because my dad wanted the Wawa, his clarinet, to sound like Clyde McCoy. And Clyde McCoy was the trumpet player. Wah, 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 wah. Right. So that's, <laughs> it was actually modeled after a trumpet player. And a uh, little known fact, my father was the first we did the first recording of the Wawa pedal and it was called the Wawa doozy and it was played on a bassoon. So the very first Wawa record was a bassoon, not in, not a guitar, not a saxophone, That's a, cool. a bassoon, believe it or not. Yep. That is insane. Yeah. It's uh yeah, man, I worked for the Royal Conservatory of Music over here in mm. Canada, uh, years ago. And we had, um, you know, a lot of people that played so many different things. And it's just such a trip that uh, some of the names that came through that place was unreal. And the things they played, and it was this, uh, that, that's cool. And, you know, it blew my mind that guitar was like probably, out of all the books that they published, was probably the least uh, big seller. And it's because so many people are self-taught. Right. You know, like people just love to just figure it out. For well, that's the beauty of guitar, right? It's it that is. kind of thing that you can pick up and, you know, you can learn a couple chords, you know, three chords, and you're playing, you can play 50 songs. Pretty right, much. you know, play, before right? you know it. Yeah, it's the beauty of guitar, and that's, you know, it's great. And now, I mean, for me, it's like, you look at YouTube, right? That's the greatest educational thing on the planet. I'm a guitar player also, and now there's so much education there, and I, I go online, and I can find pretty much anything I need to learn. It's, it's beautiful. <laughs> That is cool. It's so true, though. I mean, the Internet's a crazy thing. And it's kind of ironic that when they started to adapt to that as a company, they started to create an online presence for uh, learning how to play. Yeah. And that ended up becoming their downfall where other companies stole that and offered it for free. Right. And uh, it really hurt them financially, I think, as a business that uh technology comes along and it's like hey that's a great idea now we're going to do the same thing but for free <laughs> that's yeah. it the free model you know it's it's freemium right the whole new model. give it away free and then you have something that you can upsell right which would be or something especially today in the music business because you can't sell music anymore there's nowhere to sell music right. you don't you sell music there's no downloads you can't sell cds I don't even have a CD player. If somebody gives me a CD, I have to go out to my my old car, my second car that's got a CD player in it to listen to it. I mean, that's that's how fast it's moved, right? right. And so right now we look at what is it that you can sell as an artist. You got a, several things. You can sell the lifestyle yep. and the relationship, right? Your relationship and lifestyle. If that's if you have something. And third, next thing is uh, the experience. That's right? right. That's basically it. So. You know, it's really a different model. But even though that's the case, I mean, this is really, I believe, one of the, you know, this this whole COVID thing that's gone down right now. If you're an entrepreneur, this is one of the greatest times in history. Period. If you, I mean, I, I can't even remember my entire life. And I've been a pretty much a serial entrepreneur. I'm on my fourth company. And so I look at the landscape right now and I'm going, this is crazy. There's so many problems that need to be solved. And things have shifted and it's completely leveled the field where a lot of these big companies and especially in the music entertainment space, a lot of these big companies are like stuck in contract law. You know, they're stuck with, they can't move quickly because they have contracts with specific yep. artists. They can only do certain things. Nobody knew this was going to happen. Right. Uh, they didn't know that the whole live industry was going to tank. And, you know, now it's, it's really, uh, you know, the, you know, kind of what we've seen is I'm a technologist is that, we, we knew where this was going. Yeah. We could see it because Zoom was around. These things were around. Conferencing was happening. You know, and we knew that we're going into a direct-to-consumer world. We knew that you know, this is the world broadcaster in the palm of my hand and, exactly. and the bank. Right. Even more I can take an order. I can buy something from you. can sell me something right now, and I can take the order. I don't need any middleman. So we're moving into that direct-to-consumer world. And so we saw all this coming, but this COVID thing just completely – change the landscape it's like we compacted five years down into five months and we're seeing it i mean just look at right now what we're doing man i mean we've got business everything's moving from this kind of virtual space and you know we're finding which is interesting is is that there is you know uh, uh th there's something that's actually very satisfying about 
hanging out with your got your cell phone you're like hanging out with your buddies you got four or five of your friends on facetime you know you might be out be watering the yard or doing something <laughs> everybody's hanging one guy's cooking and you're just like party it feels like you're there right? right it's almost like you're there and the kind of the nice part is is do i don't have to go home i just hit the button boom and i'm home right? exactly. uh, i don't have to drive or have to do that so i mean there's a, there are a lot of benefits i mean obviously there's nothing like being in front of people and communicating right. But it's getting pretty interesting, and I think this this new this new thing is really driving new business models. That's what I'm focused on, and how we can take advantage of this. But I think for artists, you know, this is probably one of the greatest times in history for for artists. It was before this, and now we're like thrown into this. And I think you're, what you're seeing is interesting. Is so many musicians now knew that they needed to get more savvy on social media and they knew right. they had to get more savvy about technology and they knew how they had to figure out how to do this. Well, it's like, you know, that they, the old story of, hey, teach a kid to swim when their babies just throw them in the water and see what happens. <laughs> and that's what's happened. We've all gotten thrown in the water and it's like, okay, sink or swim. How do I get past this, right? Okay. So yeah, it's, that's the game we're in right now. But, you know, I'm very, truthfully, I'm very excited about so many opportunities right now that are just, in this space, you know, with my company, we're, 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 uh, I, I could not be more thrilled about the things that we're doing right now. Absolutely. And I, I feel like it is a game changer for like, uh, it, it's really kind of changed the playing field where e-commerce is now so beneficial. You don't have a store to pay all that crazy overhead. And, uh, you know, at any time, there's no contract. You could cancel your website if it's not panning out. It, yeah. It's almost a, a no lose situation, right? And don't forget on demand delivery. Right. I don't even have to. I don't have to hold inventory anymore. I can exactly. like just. I can just have a have whatever it is. You order it, boom! It's print and made and sent to you. So that's what I. There's a lot of interesting models right now, and all these services are online. So you know, I think the most important thing for you know artists is to get educated right now and just Absolutely. like learning the new things, right? Yeah. it's so beneficial i mean that's what i do you know i'm an mma fighter but you know i realize you can't do that forever you can't get punched in the face forever or else you're gonna end up you know not being a, right you're gonna be <laughs> concussion <laughs> cte all that craziness man you know yeah. there comes a point and i decided you know okay if i'm gonna do the family thing I, like i was saying to kenny i don't want to be married to my career and dating my family on the side it should yeah. be the other way around yeah. So it's like, it's time to step away from the road. I've had a great career. I've got to meet so many celebrities and, you know, things of that nature because I became known all over the place and it was great. But it's like, I can do this business thing now and people care because of who I am and they know who I am. I yeah. can do books. I could do this show, which uh, I, I've started a year ago now. And my guest list is ridiculous. And right. it's, it's cool. It's like people care. So it's like, then I don't need to do this anymore. I could do this from home. Yeah, well, that's the beauty is, I mean, think about it. The most important thing is these tools are virtually free. Yeah. I mean, really, I mean, for the cost, I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm, like I said, this right here <laughs> is a worldwide bro inter interactive broadcast network. Right. And I don't need, I can, I don't, audience, I don't need anybody to get it. Remember back in the day, the labels, everybody and all the music, band, they always own the customer. Right. right. We were get paid from them. They were the middleman. I don't need a middleman anymore. And especially when you think about it, Kevin Kelly, who was, you know, from Wired Magazine, you know, 10, 12, 15, I forget how many years ago, coined a phrase called the thousand true fans. And it's considered a true fan is somebody that will spend $100 a year on whatever you have to offer. If I have 1,000 of those true fans, there's 100,000 in revenue. There right? you go. So the model has shifted to where we go to smaller, it's more group-like, it's more solving problems and, or, or creating value for a smaller group of people. That's why I teach, uh, I actually teach a thing called SPACE, which is called Story, Plan, Army, Conversion, Education. I taught it out at USC. It was a startup for artists and it was a thing. And it's really about the fact that we now have the ability to go direct, I can build my own audience, we're moving into hives, smaller groups of people. Yeah. And so I teach everybody to go small. Don't try to, you know, don't boil the ocean. You don't need to get to millions of people anymore. You right. need to get that first thousand people, generate that first hundred thousand in reoccurring kind of revenue on a yearly basis. And then you grow from there. 
So it's really about going small. I actually have a friend who's a really great artist and she's been an independent and doing her own thing for years. We were having a conversation about this and she says, well, really, in, tr in reality, I have about 100 to 125 fans. And she says, that covers my entire nut for the year. Yeah. As long as I keep servicing those fans, building the relationship, dealing it, I'm making enough that I can make it. And everything else after that is gravy. So it's really about getting that, finding that super fan, building that revenue model. Because we also know from the data that 60% of your revenue will come from one to two to one to three percent of your total audience. Right. So if you've got 100,000 fans, let's say on one of the things, it's really one to 2,000 people that really care about what you're doing out of all of those people that are the, really the ones you want to go after. So, you know, the whole model from my point of view is really just to identify those super fans, build, build value for them, things that they care about, and then expand from there, you know, and especially with technology right now. I mean, there's so many interesting uh, models. And the one that I'm working on right now is really how do we solve, where's entertainment going? What is the next live entertainment model? And I believe it's based on three things. One, the live event, but it'll be, you know, we had BC, which was before COVID. <laughs> now we're, we got IC, we're in COVID, and then we're going to go to AC, right? <laughs> well, the new model is the AC world is going to be still, I think, a, a different form of a live event or social distance things, at least for a while. Um, and so the idea is, is how do I do a live event? And then the add the other thing, the streaming, right? We have streaming, but the real the real value of streaming, I believe, is the fact that it's two way. So it's interactive. It allows for people to be part of it. So we're involved in like our whole thing is is how do we build a business model where we make it live fan in stream, right? We can bring the fan into the the, the mix. We just finished doing a test run, uh, an experiment. Uh, really mostly for the band at the time and just for a certain group of fans where we set up on a sound stage, we put big led walls behind us, had those show, but we put 15, I think it was 15 80 inch monitors around the band, right? So we could see them all. And then we brought everybody in through zooms, right? Cool. And we had, you know, a few hundred people on this thing and they were like 10 feet away from us. And we were blowing and playing and communicating and taking requests and That's cool. everybody loved it. It was like being in a living room, but more importantly, it created a vibe for the artists to feel like they were actually playing a live event where you could see people. And in a funny way, it was interesting that because the fans were there and everybody's face is this big, it was like everybody was in the front row. Right. Right? There was nobody like, you know, because 20 rows back, you can't see who's there. You kind of see a face, but you don't really know who it is. Here, it's like everybody's face was right in the front. Right. Cool. So we see that being important ways to create that fan experience. But then the third thing that changes it for me, that really takes it to the next level, is the fact of delivery service because right now i can't hand you something through this screen we're right. talking we're live in real time we're seeing everything we're just like we're next to each other but i i can't give you something but now i have delivery service so that means i can have something delivered to your house that can right. interact with our event Which right is cool. i mean a yeah. simple one is i can have a wine tasting wine can show up we can share wine that's a simple one right yeah. but as you get into it more you start thinking about well where are we going we're actually looking at the world where i don't think people are going to go into you know clubs and stuff and things right now for a while till this whole thing gets figured out and right. you know, we may continue to live in this kind of a world for a while i don't think things are going to really change but people have trusted sources they'll have parties at their houses you know people have super bowl parties they love a live event everybody comes together for the exciting so if you can, now i can create live streams live events i can then make it interactive i can actually bring them into the streams and then i can actually deliver them something they can have a party so we're we're in the midst of building that business right now and that model where we deliver a, a party box that goes along with our live shows and we're getting ready to do that our first uh one coming up in the week of october 11th and so we're shooting our first series of these things where we're incorporating all these ideas and testing all this out that's brilliant and i yeah. love that um i was thinking the same thing like you know because i run a business same thing and it's mm -hmm. kind of like i'm always thinking how can i improve things and then I thought, well, now I got all these guests on the show and everything else that people are obviously fascinated by. They'd love to hear the stories. 
And the common complaint with YouTube now is like the suppression of views. If, if you open tabs in different, uh, you'll see that it'll say you have X amount of views and a different tab will say you have extremely lower than what, and it's like, they, they don't want to pay out. And I get that, you know, they're screwing you. You can't views, um, you know, uh, ticket sale, all that stuff is fine. And that's kind of hard, but really it's like, what is it you can sell? Exactly. Right. What is the products that you can sell along with? So like for me, with our network, we're launching, it's called livin.live, L-I-V-N dot live. And we're launching a whole series of shows. The idea is, is that it's, we're selling products. Exactly. We're selling things, right? Because now we have, like I said, we've got services where they can, I can, they can outsource all the fulfillment. I can go through Amazon. I mean, there's a whole bunch of ways now to make it happen. If I build the right workflow and business kind of flow right exactly. so all the tools are there it's just really about thinking so i'm like you know I'm, I'm like real excited because i can see how these models can work and you know running the financials and stuff the business models look great so i think for artists once they start understanding what this really means and you know the tools are even get more robust i mean it's like a mad scramble now man people it is. are running to build technologies i i'm talking with a whole bunch of different technology companies right now and there's some that are very interesting with new ways to create engagement in this virtual world we're actually working with some because our whole model is bringing in latest technologies to make that are experience based that we can deliver to people and wherever they are in their homes and things like that so um there's some very fascinating things that are about to pop uh, that are going to really, I think, change this experience even, even, you know, even a lot more. So this is the time, again, I, for artists, business people. Uh, it doesn't matter. This is a direct-to-consumer business online world, right? You, right. Can, you can start stuff up right now, right? Yeah, we're so lucky. I mean, in the sense that um, for me, for my show, it's like I get all these guests and I'm like, I know people are going to have so many things they want to know. Yep. And I'm like, I put myself in the perspective of the listener and I'm like, they're going to be like, why didn't you ask this? And why didn't you ask that? And I know I have the luxury of doing pre-recorded so I can release it at a set date. I've got like the next two months easy packed with, that's great with bookings and I can just have it on a timer and I could go on the 11th. Like I'm going to do for like three days, go camping, just kind of unwind my show is uninterrupted because it's on a timer, but at the same time, there is something to be said for live. And yeah. instead of YouTube, there's now Twitch where I can do my show live and fans can ask questions in real time. And I could be the mouthpiece and be like, they want to know this, you know, this person asked that. I'm like, I, right. I want to experiment with that and Big see if, if it takes off, I will start to lean gradually into that on a permanent basis uh to the best of my ability at least yeah and uh, offer that a little more and i think that's really the way to go uh, yeah i mean remember everything everything's about real time now yeah real time is the new the new thing right and we're seeing that more and more and more um you know obviously there is an after a market things people still want to get content in different ways but right. i think really the new frontier is really the whole concept of live especially because people want things that are live because there's certain things that can be raw about that live you know they want to be part of it it's like it's really interesting when i was i was watching an example of of, of this concept to me is is i was watching they had when this when the covid thing real first hit they had cbs television had you know uh, artists from home show right they, there were people coming in to do their stuff well that show they had like 75 percent of it was pre-recorded and people were there and it was so slick it just didn't work and right. then right after that uh garth brooks came on with him and his wife in their studio just live telling stories taking requests right. and it was the most compelling thing i'd seen no, but people are, we don't want to see all that slick stuff anymore. I mean, I think right. the real value is this raw thing that we get to see yeah. people for what they really are, right? That's amazing too, because I was literally just talking to Kenny about that. And I said, I personally, I don't think, you know, a lot of things are meant to be so polished. 
I said, I, I want to collect vinyl again because I feel there's so many musicians and bands that you probably get a better experience and more what they intended to sound like on vinyl than you would on a CD. Yeah, even more for me, I would say it's really about the process of how we made records too back in the day. Right. Time. We I talked mean, about that too. Because part of it was, is you know, a lot of times mistakes that we thought were mistakes when we make them, they're really acts of God. <laughs> like yeah. they're like little little things. You know, it's funny when I when I record, I'll come in the studio and I'll do stuff, and I'll I'll just like set up, you know, five or six tracks, put it in, just go for it, and just do five takes, top to bottom, and don't listen to it. I'll get up the next day because I'll, I'll hear things where I thought I made a mistake or it didn't go where I went and I would have went back. My head was open. <laughs> and then I'd come back the next day and I listen to it. And a lot of times when I hear that thing, I'm like, it was beautiful. Right. It works. It was like, oh, I was ragged and I didn't fix it. Right. Because I, I believe, you know, like I think we've become victims of overchoice. Yes. Because especially in the studio when we're recording, because we have so much power. Now, there's a lot of value in that. Don't get me wrong. I love it. But and and do it but it's really dangerous because you can take all the magic out of something so simply i always think you know it's like i believe first of all that the real magic in so many things happens in the one to two takes i mean those things that are really they touch you with the soul that solo it just it just happens because you weren't thinking and you were just kind of playing and it just becomes a it's the whole expression, right? Exactly. So now it's like you can go in there, you can fix everything. That's why I think the most dangerous button on the recording console is the solo button. <laughs> like, oh, we'll go in, we'll cut a track, like we'll all cut tracks and we'll come back the next day and we heard it was rocking. We're listening, yeah, it's really rocking. You say, let's hear the bass. You solo the bass and you go, God, he's a little out of tune. You know, we, hey. we should fix that, right? And then we start fixing it, right? right? And then you start fixing more and you start making the next thing you know, that you listen to the demo was had spirit and soul when the other one sounded better sonically all fixed but it lost all the yeah it becomes art. robotic the robotic and, and that's why i like so many of the old records why they still stand the test of time like pink floyd right those right. records still stand the sense the test of time you know stones the who led zeppelin though there's just something about you hear people think when they're playing or not, not think, you know, you, you see, they get into <laughs> right. that zone. It's like getting into that zone and capturing. That's why I still love to, you know, when we're tracking, I love to track with real players and get everybody in the right head space and lay down a track. It right. just has a different thing to it. Right. It's but, um, so I just think, you know, we got to be careful with that, uh, with all these tools and don't get me wrong, I don't want to sound goofy because there's some incredible stuff being done and these tools allow for incredible stuff, but it really starts to come down to uh, oh, the taste, you know, of the producers. Right. You no, know, they say, hey, don't, 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 don't change that. That little mistake is beautiful. Leave it in right. there, right? It's a little out of tune. It just sounds like there's more of you, right? Don't, don't fix everything because that's where the magic comes, right? I feel like there's got to be something to be said too for like, uh, you know, if you overdo it, how are you going to recreate that live? If it's yeah. too perfect and too polished and the technology did the work. Well, remember how they do it live. They play the track. Right. Like how everything's done right now. I mean, like, I, I couldn't believe it. I mean, I was like, you know, it's a Katy Perry tour. It's like, you know, she hires all these young musicians to come in, but they're playing to complete tracks. So they just got to get people to, kind of do the track and i mean that some of them are playing to it don't get me wrong but all that shit sequence background right. stuff, when you go see this stuff it sounds so good today is because they're doing the the whole you know it's all the samples and all the stuff that they're actually playing to those tracks and it's a great i mean it's killer when you go to the like these clubs and these bands are using sequences <laughs> to play with i mean it sounds unbelievable right and so to the average year but again it's it's a little bit tricky uh, right from, uh, not doing it. i remember it was so funny when i was i did a i actually played with duran duran and i went to um i'll never forget this we were in australia and we were playing and we actually that was the early days of when duran was playing to we had an eight track task am it was running all the stuff. It wasn't even digital in those days. And nobody <laughs> knew. That was like hidden behind the secrets, right? right? I'll never forget the day. We're blowing along, and then the tape broke. <laughs> and then you're like, <laughs> everybody was playing. It was all hilarious. 
<laughs> Holy shit. Uh, Nobody even realized. It just oh, they don't even realize it. You know, so. But that was pre, you know, samples. Now it's all programmed into the keyboard. Right. right. So you're not like that tapes, but yeah, it's a little bit interesting what's going on. <laughs> it's crazy. I mean, um, uh, you know, it's funny, and I know people are I, – I was talking about this before, and people are going to be like, wow, that's uh, – you know, there's there's a lot of people that probably won't understand this because they're too young, but uh, the wooden panel-looking cases that you pull out the drawers full of cassettes, <laughs> and I'm like, man, I remember back in the day seeing, you know, uh, all these different tapes – Oh, I still got a ton of them, man. I've been actually just digitizing everything. Right. Finally, because it's getting to the point where it's falling apart. I'm in a big digitizing mode right now. I've been pulling together. I, you know, I, I, all through the years, I've been kind of a collector and I've been pulling this stuff and just throwing it in boxes and boxes, you know, for a zillion years. I, I actually shot 150 hours of Pink Floyd video while I was out on the road. And, <laughs> you know, I got cassettes of everything to all these tours and things like that. Hey. It's so fascinating to, to uh, start to go through that stuff again. It's really it's tricky. Yeah. You know, yeah. And I mean, to go through the mindset of remembering all the tapes and everything, all these bands, and it's like, then fast forward a ton of years later, I'm sitting down and talking to these cats like about their experience making those tapes. Yeah. And it's like, what a trip, dude. Life is so nuts. You know, yeah. you, you know I, I have to assume... Working with Pink Floyd's got to be a trip in and of itself. You oh, know? yeah, there's there's no question. I mean, <laughs> Pink Floyd, I mean, you know, and it's really funny is <laughs> when I got the gig, I didn't know anything about Pink Floyd. I mean, I'm telling you, I mean, zero. Right. I was, I was into, you know, Junior Walker and Stevie Wonder. And, you know, I was an R&B guy. I cared right. about that. I didn't really know anything about psychedelic rock or anything. It was just because I was a saxophone player, right? Right. And so I'm mostly, and it's not a place where you spend a bunch of time. And it's just, it's so funny because um, I got called to play on the record. And it's a long story. I'm, I met Dave Gilmore when he came to play on our Super Tramp record. That's dope. And then uh, we hung out a little bit and he came to a show that I did a week later. I did with Jeff Beccaro and all those great, you know, the great drummer Jeff. And because, and, um, and uh, so after he came to that event, he called me up and he said, Oh, we're, um, why don't you come put some solos on the, one of our records? So I went to the studio. I didn't really know who they were. <laughs> <laughs> I really know. It was just, it was a session. I go to a session. I go to the date and all this stuff. And I uh, it's a, it's a kind of a long story. But anyway, I went and put the solos on the record, and um, and then still didn't really know a bunch about them. Right? I just figured it was a session. And I came back home, and then a couple of days later, I get a call, and I pick up the phone. It's an English guy. It's Dave Gilmore. <laughs> Oh, hello, Scott. It's Dave here. Blah blah blah. And then he offered me the you know the job to join the band. We're going out again. Blah blah blah. And then he said, "Well, it's you know we're going to be going out for two years." So it's like going on the road for two years. And I was like, "That's commitment." Oh man, two years on the road. I don't know. And I didn't know anything. I said, "Well, Dave, let me think about it. Let me get back to you. Can I let you know?" Yeah. Okay. Let me know. So I got on the phone and I start calling my friends. I said, "I got this call from this guy Dave Gilmore to that." Uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> to do this Pink Floyd tour. And they're like, and I said, I don't, I'm wondering, because I was working on a project, a big project, and I would have to give that up to go on. And, and they're like, dude, you got to do that record. You got to go do that. I said, you just played on a Floyd record? I said, yeah, I went played on this record, right? And they're like, said, so you have to go play with this. this. is like, that's unbelievable, right? And I said, well, I don't really know anything. And so that night I went to Tower Records and I got the, I bought the record, brought the stuff back home, got some Floyd records, listened to the stuff. I said, yeah, that's cool. You know, I, I was not, again, it's that psychedelic music wasn't my thing. I was like, okay, it's pretty cool. And I called a couple of other friends. I said, dude, you have to do that job. <laughs> you don't do that. Job. You're an idiot. So I called Dave back. I said, all right, let's go, Dave. I bid, right? Okay. Next thing I know, I'm in, a, in Toronto in a freaking airplane hangar out in the middle of the tarmac at the, at the Toronto airport where we took over this giant 
thing. And now they're, they're shuttling us out in between 747s to get out into this place. I'm in this room, man. There's pigs flying, freaking spaceships. I mean, the things like crazy beds flying through the air, <laughs> lighting rig that is like a, nothing I've ever seen in my life. You know, I was like, holy crap, this is really something, right? So, and then the rest is there. You know, there you go. <laughs> and that's where I'm from is Toronto, actually. I just, well, yeah. Three years ago, I moved out here to Nova Scotia. Uh, get away from all the craziness of Toronto because it's so busy and expensive. And I just kind of yeah. thought, you know, now it's time to unwind and enjoy my success and whatever. And it's beautiful here. So, you know, uh, even Kenny. Where, where are you again? Nova you Scotia. See? Nova Scotia. Oh, you're up in Nova Scotia. Yeah, I did yeah. a gig up there. Boy, God, quite a few years ago. What was that I did up there? Uh, they had a, uh, oh, did we, I think we rehearsed Super Tramp up there or one of our kids i remember because i was in nova scotia and then i went to nova scotia for a trade show believe it or not because uh, i was big, I, I really got into the tech space you know right. i was in tech i launched tech companies and so i was kind of a speaker and i remember going up to that place yeah it's beautiful up there it's very s slow but very cool right it's you know it's mellow as hell it's just so like yeah. a relaxed vibe old school in a sense right of and i love that so and look we're doing you're able to run your business from there right <laughs> you know and i can just relax and just do what i do i get to talk to awesome interesting people and uh i have no complaints man it's the best thing i ever did toronto was so hectic and it's just like eventually you get tired of that i right. spent my whole life there i was born in etobicoke just outside of toronto part of toronto and uh, I spent my whole life there and I was like, you know what? It's time for a change. And this yeah. just seemed to be it. And best thing I ever did. Nice. And, uh, you know, it's just so mellow. It, yeah. The stress level has just decreased immediately. Yeah. <laughs> I do love Canada. I mean, it's fun up there. And uh, we're actually getting ready to go do nine shows up in, in December uh, up Cute. in Quebec City. Okay. Up in Quebec City up there doing some shows. So Yeah, that's about four hours, I think, from me. I yeah. passed I passed through that to get here because I did the road trip thing from oh, wow. Toronto to so it was about uh, did about a twelve hour drive straight and then stopped in New Brunswick for the night and then uh, finished off the next two hours or so the next day. Yeah, so. well, if you could, December first through the seventeenth, I think we're doing nine shows broken up over there. So you want to have a four hour drive? Come on down, be my Hell. guest, man. It's going to be pretty rocking. We got you know, Stephen Perkins, Kenny Olson, who's going to be there, who you just talked to. Uh, you know, we've got great Norwood Fisher from Fishbone and stuff. We're going to have a great, it's going to be big fun in this immersive, this brand new immersive theater that they've built. And it's uh, actually a bunch of the guys that um, I've been working with that were early day guys all out of Cirque du Soleil. And so it's a beautiful, it's going to be an incredible show down there. They've got two on each side of the band. They're hundred foot, 20 foot LED walls, hundred on each side full dinner thing, full immersive theater, this whole thing. So it's going to be actually fun. We're going to do our, our think, my company think experience. Our first experience we've been doing is a think Floyd experience. Oh, that's so brilliant. Think Floyd there. <laughs> and, uh, and you know, now that I play, I'm, I'm, I'm now the biggest pink. Now, I knew nothing about Pink Floyd then, but now I am the biggest Pink Floyd fan on the planet. Dave Gilmore is my mentor, my guru, my hero. I mean, that guy taught me so much about music. So, uh, yeah, we love playing that stuff. And, boy, Kenny Olsen does a great job on those solos and stuff that Gilmore plays. I, I can't not attend that because Kenny insisted. He's like, you got to give me your number when we're done here. Yep. And what I got to come to Canada and hang out with you. If, if he's four hours away and I don't get my ass over there, I'll yep. hear the end of it. I got Perkins on the show tomorrow. So oh, good. you got the whole thing. You, got the <laughs> right. thing yeah, yeah. you know, so like, how could I not go now? Now you got to go. Well, there's three I, of us. I'd be the biggest dick <laughs> if I didn't <laughs> make the trip and I can't have that. So, you know, you're going to have fun down there. That's going to be a really a fun gig. I'm actually looking, really looking forward to it. Big, big production, big time production. It's going to be pretty, pretty mind boggling. I can't even believe what they're doing. You know, working with the whole production crew and stuff on this. So it should be, it should be a blast. It sounds brilliant. I mean, yeah. that sounds super cool. And yeah, with we all, just, Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, with, with just with everything that's been going on. I mean, it's much needed yeah. at this point. I think it's going to oh, be yeah. really cool. 
Yeah. I was just going to say, we have been, our whole thing of think experiences and immersive entertainment coming. So we've been looking at ways to create the live experience. And uh, we had just finished doing 40 shows in a 360 degree immersive dome in downtown LA. We sold them all out. You know, it was 500 people. You lay down and you're on these beds that are plugged into the music and it's mind boggling. You're completely surrounded with visuals. It's like you're, it's almost like a shared virtual reality experience. You really know, true. Everybody's gonna be on streams doing that. <laughs> you, just there, you, know. you could see that there might have been a few drugs going on when we were playing. I could see a few people. I had a couple people come up and hug me crying. <laughs> oh my god, I never had an experience like that. My like, oh my god, they're like crying. These are like big CEOs and stuff, right? right. Of these companies. And I'm like, you guys have too much fun tonight. I can see oh they love it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and I mean, there's something to be said about those things because I feel like, you know, when it's natural and it's not man-made garbage that yeah. you don't know what's in it and it could kill you. I yeah. feel like, you know, I waited uh, until this year, actually, the first time I ever touched shrooms. Wow. And I'm glad I did because I, I know in high school back in the day, it was like everybody just wanted to get like fucked up you know yeah. and i'm like no like i'm glad that i waited to respect the experience yeah, because it is a game changer it takes away ego it changes the way you view things you feel for other people on some next level where you feel connected to everything and you just don't get all the hate that social media has yeah. you're like i don't understand this well, you know, it's fascinating because, you know, for me, I, I took a very heavy spiritual path quite a few years ago. I mean, it's, there, to me, there's nothing more important than consciousness, the concept. And exactly. It's my favorite subject. So one of these days, if you want to have a show about that, I could come on and talk about that. All I am long. desperate. To one do. of my favorite things, right? That's my, that's my topic. That's what I care I about. I love most. that. Um, and, um, you know, and it's interesting because I've heard so many people there is that thing, you know, it's basically stopping thought and stopping thinking something else takes over. And so there's a lot of studies and stuff now that are, that are saying that this is like one of those things that can sort of crack that ego consciousness thing. Right. Because, you know, right. we're, you know, it's so fascinating to me is so many people don't realize, and this is where, you know, when you really grasp this concept is this one thing that the only thing that is real is you and me talking right now. Exactly. Everything else is an illusion. Yep. You're, huh? What do you mean everything else is illusion? What can that be? Well, two minutes ago, I can't change. I can't touch. I can't do it. It's just all I can do is remember it. Two minutes from now, I can imagine, but I can't touch it. So the right. only thing, the only space that I can do anything is right now. It's, it's, that's it. Right. That's it. So when people suffer, it's because they identify with thinking. They're not awake enough to say, well, where am I? And where, I, I guess I'm actually okay. I could be sitting here suffering like crazy because of thoughts. Oh, the world's crashing. What am I going to do? I'm gonna pay right. blah, 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 blah. All this shit that goes on in your head over and over and over and over again. Man, I'm like lost and suffering and anxiety and fear and all these things are going on. And dude, I'm sitting here talking to you drinking some water. Right. <laughs> Reality, there's no lion chasing me right now. So. Right. You know, these, these type of, this concept, I mean, it changed my life dramatically because now I don't, I don't get caught up like I did in the past just melts away for me because it has no value anymore. Right. And the future is, is, what are you going to do? It's like for me, when I, well, this year was going to be our biggest year for Think Experience, you know, with Perkins and all of us, we were, you know, we did our year kind of MVP, getting everything going. We were, we were going to put a, the 1600 seat of dome immersive dome theater up here in Los Angeles. You know, it was incredible. This thing we're working with same guys that I'm working with out of Toronto from the circus out of Montreal, the circus LA guys. We were going to, we were supposed to play jazz fest. We were going to Europe again. We had, we had a whole bunch of stuff that was going on and it all just vanished. Right. All the revenue, everything gone. Boom. Like this. But I got up that morning when I finally realized everything's shutting down. Where this is it. It's, it looks like it's over. And I just said, you know what? All of that, what was going to happen was just an illusion. Right. It never happened. <laughs> exactly. I don't know what could have happened. I could have went to freaking Jazz Fest, fell down in the street and broke my head open and been done. So it, you can't put any attention on the future. It's all about the ride. Exactly. Right? I mean, the future has no value. That's why people that it's fine to have goals. But when you attach to the goal, 
That's where the suffering comes in. I have seen so many people that got these goals. Oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to make it happen. And they're all excited because it's moving in the right direction. Right. And then all of a sudden you get that curveball. Now you're going the other direction. And now it's, whoa, no, I can't reach my goal. Oh, suffer, suffer, right. suffer, suffer, right? And you're suffering of something you could never touch. Right. And that's why the identifying with goals in the future is insane. So our number one problem that we have is we is time, the illusion of time. Time is an illusion. Yeah, there's not time is only something a man made that I can kind of make. It's there's only one moment in time. It's always the same moment. It never yeah. changes. The moment you move around in the same moment. That's right. If I get up and go walk over there. The moment hasn't changed. I go to my car. It's the moment. The moment. The moment. It's the same moment. You're the always moment in it. When I'm when I'm really put my attention is where I'm or I'm at. And so, you know, once you start to grasp this, suffering goes away because you realize you're suffering for because of insanity of the egoic mind. So the right. you've got to flip your you gotta flip and realize that you're not the thinker, but you're actually the watcher, that voice that's in the back that tells your mind, you know, your mind suggests something and whether I do it or not is really about how conscious I am, right? <laughs> am I exactly am I doing it? So, you know, I, like I tell everybody, there's no other, there's no other journey more important than that one because it makes life so much simpler when you're not identified with all the things that go on in the insanity because our egos will make us crazy. So I tell people, here's a great exercise to start to kind of wake up because once you wake up, no more suffering. Exactly. You hear me? Absolutely. No more suffering, dude. It's <laughs> awesome. And the reason is because you're only paying attention to where you are. Remember, it's all about being aware. And what awareness is, is uh, where am I, right? And that's being aware of where you are at that moment. Stop and smell the roses. Classic out of the Bible. What does that mean? It means to stop and be present enough to see where you're actually at. But the problem is people can't think. I can't tell you how many people you see walking around like this all day long. They're like in a machine. They're not even seeing what's going on around them. They're not even there. They're somewhere totally else. Right. They're completely somewhere else. I know. I was, I was there. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, once you let go of all that, it's like, Forget it. I mean, it's just, there's nothing more important because then you lose all fear. So I always tell everybody, this is a great exercise, right? Here it is. As often as you can during the day, stop where you are and ask yourself this simple question. Put it, first of all, put your, every cell of your body, your attention of where you are. Right now I'm sitting in this chair. I'm in this room. I put all my attention and I ask myself, what am I feeling right now? If I'm feeling any anxiety, tension, or fear, it just tells you you're identified with a thought. Exactly. The thought is what's making you crazy. That thought you're running through your head all day long like a hamster. You're going crazy. It's the thought. Because the reality is I'm sitting here in my water. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not being chased by a lion. I'm not getting killed. Right. I'm not uh, everything's actually okay right now. It doesn't mean I don't have other issues and things that I got to deal with. But when you're not all caught up in it and you're looking at it for what it is, because listen, life's ups and downs. We got to accept it. So the goal, the goal is always to do one thing, accept everything that happens to you as if you wanted it to happen that way. And I don't care what it is, exactly. everything. Everything, as hard as it is, you want to, you accept it because the goal, the holy grail is this, surrender to what is, because we suffer when we don't accept what is. I have a friend, man, his car got a new car. He was all excited. Oh my God. He got his car and somebody backed into his car and smacked his thing. I'm telling you, this guy suffered for a freaking month. Wow. I'm saying, dude, the car was hit. It's over. It. You can't fix it. You can't change it. It's done. <laughs> Let it go. You took it in. You're going to get it fixed. Right. Don't worry about it. Let it go. Oh, my God. My car. I can't believe it. I spent all this money. I built this thing da, 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 for days and days. I'm going, dude, let it go, brother. That's self and <laughs> The car was hit. It wouldn't have gotten hit unless it was supposed to get hit. It right. got hit. And what it got hit for <laughs> was for you to learn how to not get attached to that. Right. Insanity, right? Uh, yeah. So, and I you know, I came from a really like crazy life 
and managed to become stupid successful because I just, you know, it was a what if situation. Good job. I, thank you. I mean, I was always told you aren't going to be nothing, blah, 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 blah. And I thought, what if, what if you're wrong? What if I just tried, right? I ended up doing motivational speaking at schools and I, I always have to tell people, first of all, forget your past to the degree of like torturing yourself because the way you remember, the way you remember things is not necessarily accurate. You will remember it the way you want to. Oh yeah. Your ego. Right. And, and scary that boy. Right. And over 70% of things people worry about never actually happen. So why oh, waste the time? No, that's the point. It's like so interesting is again, in my entire life, I cannot think of one time it never worked out. Right. Exactly. I mean, it always works out. That's right. Hundred percent of the time, it worked out. Not not necessarily the way I actually thought it was going to, or I wanted it to at the time. But I can't tell you how many times I was like, "Oh, I wish this would have happened." Oh, I wish. And then all of a sudden, something else happened, and I'm like, "I'm so thankful the other thing didn't happen because if I would have done that, I wouldn't have done this." I am so glad you said that because, like, <laughs> I tell people, even if the career you thought was for you didn't work out. Trust me on this when I say this. I was I signed up for the military. I waited for three years on a waiting list because that was like the length of the Canadian waiting list for the military. Okay. I ended up getting into MMA, became stupid, successful, known everywhere, have a show, whatever, and I'm not risking my life. Not getting into the military is the best thing that never happened to me. Isn't that strange? That's what I'm saying. It, it, you know it's what I mean? all about the journey, man. And it's actually, if you think about it, Alan Watts is a great, I don't know if you know who Alan Watts, great philosopher. And he talks about life and the facts that life is more like music or dancing. It's like, it's like, as we are right now, our goal is we get up, we, we, we think I'm going to go to college. I'm going to go do this and I'm going to get there and then I'm going to go be successful. And then I'm going to work and you go all through your life. Like, okay, I'm going to get there. I'm going to get there. I'm going to get there. And once you get it, you make your money, you finally get there and you go, what did I get there for? Right. Right. You know, it's, it's, the, and, and it's like <laughs> when he says it's more like the dance or music, because when you start us, when you dance or you, you know, or start a song, if it was about getting to the end, you, there'd be, da da. we just play the last note. Right. <laughs> right. It wouldn't be any of the other part. Right. right. And it's like dancing. You don't get up to dance to get to the end of the dance. You get up to dance to dance and experience that thing. So that's what really life is about. It's all about the journey. So the only thing that matters is the step that you're taking right now because exactly. it's the only one that's real. So if you can stay awake enough and aware enough of what's going on, where you are, tasting food, being aware and being observant of all the things that are actually happening that you can actually touch, you can feel, whatever you can do, then you're living. And it's called being aware. It's awareness. But here's the problem. <laughs> here's the puzzle. I'm going to call it the problem. Here's the puzzle mm -hmm. for people to figure out. Aware, everybody says, be aware. But how do I know I'm aware that I'm aware? <laughs> That's right. How do I know I'm aware? Because what will happen is your mind and your ego say, I'm aware right now, but you're really not. No, you're still not. asleep. You're, you have no idea. You think you are because when you think, that's the problem. It's labeling and thinking. Because remember, the whole goal of all of this, the, the concept of enlightenment is really around the concept of no mind, no thought. But then uh, how, how do I not think? Right? What does it mean not to think? What does it feel like not to think? What is it? Well, we experience a certain or that when somebody jumps out of an airplane or something, you know, when they're doing oh, that first moment, man, the mind goes away and you're just like, you're just there. Right. So you get a taste of presence. Right. Same thing. I'm sure when you're in the middle of, for me, it's like certain things. I oh, was yeah. trying to figure out why certain times in my life I played better than other times. And I finally realized after through all this kind of meditation and work that I did that what happened was I stopped thinking. Right. Thought dropped. And something else was, can, can, was happening. Because what, another thing that people don't realize is that this is a fact. The mind is incapable of knowing truth from falsehood. Exactly. Because it doesn't know the difference between right or wrong. Exactly. If it did, it's easy to prove. If the mind was capable of doing that, there'd be no war. Exactly. There'd be nobody taking their five-year-old kid in the name of Allah, blowing him up, thinking they're doing something good. You would do that because it just makes no sense, right? So... What makes you sense is conscious. How aware are you of the thoughts? So you've got one says, do this, don't do this. 
but that little voice in the background says, you know, I don't think that's a good idea. Oh, right. I'm tempted, but maybe I shouldn't do that. So it's really that you're trying to get away from the ego and the mind controlling everything to the point where you become the watcher. So that's the first step you have to go through is get to the point where you start to realize, wait a minute, who's watching? Right. Like that little separation. I'm thinking, but I'm watching my thinking. Oh, is there two of me? <laughs> and that's just it. That's a question. So, yeah. I always tell true. people, uh, if, if what you're doing doesn't give you that butterfly feeling in your gut, what are you doing it for? What's the point? Yeah. If, if there's nothing to lose, you know what I'm saying? And I said, like, people don't decide – I'm going to ruin my life today. They don't oh, they do the best they can. Everybody right. does the best they can. It's always small decisions that are poor decisions that seem like they don't matter that add up. Like, I'll put that off till later. I'll do that later. I don't really care about this grade or this job or this promotion or whatever. I, you know, it can wait. And then it all adds up. And then before you know it, you blew it. Yep. Yeah. It's funny. I mean, it's, you know, it, Everything happens the way it's supposed to happen. Otherwise, it wouldn't have happened. Right. Just think about that. <laughs> Whatever it is, it happened because it was supposed to happen. Now, I maybe didn't like it to happen. I didn't want it to happen. But it happened because it was supposed to happen. The question right. is, why did it happen? Well, really, the, remember, life is it's, it's, the, the whole thing is all these challenges we have are opportunities for us to wake up. Every time you get pounded, that's why suffering is such a core. If you look at suffering as a th be thankful for it, which is a weird thing to say, right? That's like, how can you be thankful for suffering about your loss or whatever it is that was happening, right? Well, Built because here. it helps you, it opens you up to realizing what's re what really matters because you're going to blink, you'll be 50, you'll blink, you're going to be on your deathbed because time yep. is an illusion. There's, it's like right now, I look back and I'm, I can imagine when I was a kid seeing the walker eating popsicles with my buddy down the street. And it feels like yesterday. The, there was no time. All, you know, 50 plus years went by, right? It's like, well, what? how did that happen? That, like I blinked and that went by. It was like, huh? Right? And so that's the point is just really getting to the point where you just accept life. And all these challenges are really about one thing, helping you wake up. And here's why they always talk about in all the spiritual practices to die before you die. Right. Right. And that's the point of surrender to what is, because when you die, when you're laying, you're like, oh, I don't want to die. And then all of a sudden you're just going to say, okay, I, I give up. I'm going. Right. You're <laughs> you, you surrendered at that point. Well, the key is, is to surrender before that point. Now exactly. so you can live life and makes life much more playful because then you deal with it. And when you look at challenges as a good thing and you don't, you know, there's no right, there's no wrong. There just is. Right. And it, it's just like, it's so crazy what we're seeing right now. With all, I mean, you're seeing insanity like we've never seen. And a perfect example of what we're seeing is how much control the media networks on programming this mind that doesn't know right or wrong. Right. We're seeing it like crazy right now, aren't we? I mean, we're seeing, I'm seeing friends not talking to other friends because of this political thing. And they're all getting all caught up in it. And for me, it's, I mean, it's, I, I look at it sad. I mean, it, 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 it's kind of, it's fun and kind of interesting to watch human behavior because the only thing that's going to solve all this problem is the human condition is what's causing it is we have to change that. We have to wake up. We have to right. stop with this insanity, but they can't because when the media keeps feeding you stuff all day long, it becomes part of it and your ego is taken over. And no, the one that's that really is amazing to me is I call it the, the love or the hate in the name of love. Right. It's hate in the name of love. It's okay for me to hate. It's those people that get up and they go, oh my God, namaste. We could, I go to my yoga, hot yoga classes, peace, everybody, love everybody, love your neighbor. Nothing matters. Be kind, kindness, everything's like this. And then it's you, Trump. Right, <laughs> right, you know? <laughs> well, that's good. What's good about that is, it is it's an opportunity for people to see that if you act like that, you're actually asleep because any form of hate in reality is just hate. It is. Everybody's doing the best we can. You would think that we would all be trying, whether we like the guy or not, we'd be like, dude, please do a good job. Right. You know, 
let's go. But no, it's like this crazy thing. So it's funny to watch for me to see this human it behavior is. going on. It's kind of sad, but you know, again, I think it's, you know, it's happening the way it's supposed to happen. It's just doing its thing. And so we're going to watch it go down. And, you know, my feeling is, is I'm, you know, I think it's all, we're here for one reason for consciousness to unfold. That's it. There's no right. other reason you're here for. You're here to help it unfold one way or another. And when I hear people say, oh, we got to save the planet. I'm like, save it, save the planet. For this what? thing's burning, spinning for four and a half, five billion years. And it's continuing on. This thing's going to go on with us or without us. It doesn't right. need humans. And actually, what's funny is, is if you think about it, you can't, the, the world can't, re, can't live without bees and certain other things, but they can sure live without humans. And yeah, what's the humans, detriment? This place <laughs> will just could grow and be flourishing and right. be good. Everything is happening. So it's like this human thing. And I, I really think we're at a point now where I think we're, we're, we're actually merging with machine, right? And this, even though this isn't like mainline into our body, we carry this thing everywhere. It's our thing. Everything happens. We got the first thing, ding, 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 ding. You know, you're, you're doing your stuff. You're like locked into this thing and, oh, I lost my phone. Oh, what am I going to do? Right? It's all this craziness. Is it not, um, is it not <laughs> ironic as hell that the more connected that technology allows us to be, the more disconnected we actually are from each other? Oh. No, no, remember, this thing is taking over now. It's right. starting to control us at the level. And now, especially with AI coming on and everybody remember the early days, they say, Oh, these computers will never replace humans and they're not going to be as smart because they don't have emotion and all that kind of stuff. And that's like, are you kidding me? Dude, these things are getting like way smarter than humans. I mean, because right. think about it. They got database, callable database of all human freaking stuff. Right. And now we have quantum computing coming on because if everybody knows original computing is or re, most computing is binary. It's either on or off. Yes or no. Right. Right. Well, now with quantum computing, it's starting to go as yes, no. And it adds maybe. So now it starts to have some logic in there where it can start to think almost in a sense. We now have computers that are actually duplicating themselves. We have computers that self heal. They've got 3D printers when the part starts to wear out, prints apart and assembles it and does it all. So these things are starting to get to that point. And now we've got AI coming in. And, you know, I, 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 in some ways, I'm wondering if that's really, if, since, first of all, since everything is consciousness, everything, I mean, everything is energy at the deepest level. When you get on the quantum level, it's all just, you know, energy. And, um, so if that's the case, then this table, this chair, this computer, everything is just energy at the deepest level, and consciousness is really energy. So the question is, is, is consciousness changing its form and moving into machines? And they're using humans to basically start to build those machines. Because now you've got these robots where they've got like human skin like on them, and you know, they've got, I mean, it's really getting crazy. They got voice stuff that's happening, you know, the whole deep fake thing that's going on oh where they can God, take videos and show you. It's getting crazy and AI, the bots are basically controlling everything. And think about it, when you go to work at Uber, your boss is an app. Right. Your boss is an app. You log into your app and it says, hello, John, <laughs> what's going on? Uh, good today, you've got these things. Here's what's happening. Here's what you did this last week. Oh, here's some softwares. You better do this a little better to get your points up. You know, it's a dang app. He's of AI, right? So, you know, I, I'm, I'm Personally, it's, it's questioning whether humans will be here in 100 years, 150 years. I think it's probably moving in that direction. We're so insane. We're trying to beat each other up. And right. Send viruses into the world to take people out. Power, insanity, oh, you know, all this stuff. And I look at it and it's, it's got, you know, it's in a way it's a little bit humorous to kind of watch. I mean, it's sad as can be, but it's actually kind of interesting to watch the human species because here's the good news. It doesn't matter. You right. don't die. Consciousness is going to go on. Exactly. Everything's okay. At the deepest level, everything's fine. If the humans want to go insane like this, good for them. Let them do right. it for a while. And that's what I always say. You know, people don't get it. I, but I often joke, too, that Terminator 2 has become the ultimate horror movie because it's so fucking on the verge of being real. No question, too. I mean, again, if you look at what COVID has done, this is a perfect example of just driving us to a place. And now everybody, nobody's out. They're not meeting any people. All they're getting is information that is fed to them all day long. And, and they believe it's like everywhere. crazy. If you, if you're paying any attention, you know, for me, I love the human behavior thing. So I'm watching all the sides of this whole thing and looking at it. And, 
And it's just, it's a mind boggling how, the, you know, the, these networks are controlling the narrative at a point where it's, it's really sad to see the dishonesty that's going on for political games and stuff. It's it really is. crazy. But, you know, for me, it's like I said, it all happens the way it's supposed to happen. I guess right. it's what's supposed to happen. And I take a lot of shit from people about my being so anti-political. Like, I don't care either way. I don't wrap myself up in it and get all stressed out. People are like, you don't care. I'm like, dude, if you are naive enough to think that any political party gives a shit about your well-being rather than their own wealth and that they're in it for you, you're falling. human condition. Right. It's human condition, right? It's this greed is built into the human condition, right? And it's just, you know, that's why it's, it's, it always blows my mind when you've got a party that's trying to make everything the equal to everybody. It's not how the world works. No, it's not. This is not. We're a, we're a, you know, we're a species that wins, lose. It's just not this. When, the minute you try to, first of all, somebody coming in and saying, "Here's how we make," we're going to tell you what you need. Right. Right. We're going to set you up and get you all figured out here. This is what you need. You need this health care. It's going to be good for you. And this <laughs> is going to be this. And then I go, "Well, who's at? Who's going to make those decisions?" Right. Oh, another human. Or you mean the same human that's doing all this destruction? Right. They can't exactly. even do it. That's why, you know, I, I happen to be a free market capitalist. I just, I just believe in capitalism in the sense, because it's more like, it's more like nature to me in the sense that it, it allows freedom and people to just do what we're doing. You know, it's, there's no, it, 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 it allows for innovation for people, it eats its young, it fixes itself, it, fails at times, but it doesn't. It's not one group of people trying to control the narrative. It just lets it happen as it's supposed to happen. Now, I believe in conscious capitalism. I think that's what needs to happen next, where we're using that, where, you know, again, I'm not, I don't believe in socialist views because that kills, from my point of view, creativity, right? right. It's a, it kills the creative thing because now it's telling you what you can do, what you can't do. And, and you, you know, the, the idea of paying people all the time and doing something kills the human spirit because part of it is, is a struggle. It's not a perfect world. It's a, per, it's a perfect world, but it's not the perfect world that you think it should be because it's perfect because of the way it works. Right. Not the way that you want to put it into some box or some moral thing. Oh, I think everybody does. Well, no, it's not, it doesn't work that way. You know, I'm up all about freedom, liberty. We need to be free get up, do whatever we can. And some people are going to suffer and some people are not. Some people are going to flurry. Some people are going to pull themselves up from their straps, those stories. Some people are going to gain and give back to society. Some people are going to give and take and steal and rob, but that's the way it works, right? Exactly. So the more conscious we can get, that's really the only answer. What I, we've been talking about is the waking up of society to being more aware so that we'd be more kind and kindness and grateful for the things that we have, for those that have, and we got to help people. And especially now, I mean, this shutting down the country and the world like we've done, this is going to be a major devastation to so many people. It already is. And I'm just looking at the, the potential for the amount of poverty and homelessness and, you know, death and destruction that's going to come from that. And, I, and it's just amazing that the humans were not having that conversation. Why is it all about the virus and we're not having a conversation about what's the consequences of shutting down? What right. is that going to do? How many people are going to die from that? I mean, I heard a, interesting statistics. A doctor came on one of the shows and said, we usually get about 150,000 people a month that are diagnosed with cancer. Right now, we're only getting 10,000. That means there's 140,000 people that aren't going to the hospitals because they're scared to go there. They're told not to, whatever, all those things, and they're not getting treated. Well, what right. is that consequence? You know, six months of people of 10,000 a month, that means you've got hundreds of thousands of people that aren't being diagnosed and what's going to happen to them? How much death is that? And that's because we were shut down. So, I mean, there's just all the consequences. We have to ask when we do something, what is it? We just got to ask the question, well, what is that consequence of doing that? Right. right? And we're then... going to do that. Sounds great. Lock down the country because it's going to save lives. Okay. We lock it down. Sounds good. We're got to see that. But what are the impacts? Why are we not having that conversation? I have no idea. It's just, it's mind boggling because it's politics, right? It's just, exactly. You know, There's an agenda there and that's what it is. Definitely. Yeah. It's interesting to watch though. I'll tell it, you. It is. I mean, because it's so divisive. Mm -hmm. uh, you just pay attention to social media and you'll look at your own friends oh. list and you'll see how many people believe certain things. Oh man, it's crazy. And it, what's really sad is, is, there's actually, if you want, if people want to really get an idea of what's happening, 
There's a beautiful documentary called Century of the Self. It's, made, it's a BBC thing. It's about four hours. And it's about a guy named Edward Bernays. Have you ever heard of Edward Bernays? I believe so, yeah. Okay, so Edward Bernays, for those that haven't heard, is he was the guy, he's a, he was the guy that coined the term. He took the word propaganda and changed it to PR, public relations. Right. And he was the marketing guy that was involved in all these major campaigns and car things back in the day. And his, his, his relative was Sigmund Freud. And together they developed how to control crowds, right? Right. And this documentary, when you go see this and they talk about this and it's beautifully done, it'll blow your mind. I mean, it's incredible. It, it'll get you the, the minute you start to watch it. So don't get scared about boards. You're going to want to see this because it's so <laughs> compelling. And you take what they did and all those theories on how they controlled crowds and moved people and got them to believe and all these things. And then you take that and you add the internet and you go, oh my God, I can't look at anything anymore the same because it's so obvious what's happening, right? It's just, this is all manipulating using behavioral science and data and stuff to manipulate the crowds. And now you've got the ultimate freaking thing. <laughs> and so you think about who controls those is really the people they're in control people to control the people right because they're getting their mind isn't capable of knowing truth so they're just getting bombarded with this stuff and it's amazing because you can have a friend and have something listen if we're pals and i know you for 15 years and you know me and i think you're a really smart guy and i'm they think i'm a smart guy and we've got something and i walk up to you and i go hey dude you gotta see this you're not gonna believe it as soon as they see it, they go, oh, my God, that's that's a lie. It's all propaganda. You're already, and you're like, wait a minute, dude. You think I'm an idiot? I'm asking you to look at this, but you've already labeled it because of where it came from or right. what it was or what the information is. And they beat you up. And it's amazing how many people are getting to getting delisted off people's Facebooks. <laughs> right. And the funniest thing is the people that think they know, you know exactly what's going on are the ones that are buying in the most. Oh, dude, it's crazy. It's <laughs> unbelievable. But that's why when you look at what's going on with the, with the networks, it's pretty sad, man. It is. It's pretty sad. You know, it's pretty freaking sad because it's obviously it's on purpose. It's not because it's caring for the people or trying to give them the right information. I mean, you would think they'd want to give the right information. Right. It's, right. It's crazy. Here you are. They talk about somebody getting, you know, one of these people getting killed and stuff. And they don't look at look what happened in Chicago. This over over Father's Day, there was 40 people killed. Why is that not important? Right. If, if it's about lives, I don't, I don't understand. But that's the human condition. And that's the part where for me, it's really about this waking up. That's why that's inward journey. There's nothing more important. There's nothing. Because exactly. that's where you can start to stand back and look at things and start to question thinking, right? You got to be free thinking. Free thinking right. is going completely away. Free thinkers are going away. And it's not because they can't help themselves. Because these are all my, they're all friends and they all mean well. These people that are on each side, they both truly believe and they, they mean as well as can be. I mean, there's no question and they're great people and they don't mean it, but they don't realize what's happened is, is it's being, it's a manipulation of behavioral science. It's using that science of how to create people to make them do things is what's causing this all to go down. And it's pretty freaking nuts. And especially the guys that own these networks. I mean, you're seeing censoring now. I, mean, I can't believe how much Facebook is censoring now. Oh and my God. That is getting that. crazy. There's so many things being censored right now. It's really valid information that we should be getting, right? To be able to do it. But no, because it doesn't fit the political narrative. The stuff that's getting centered doesn't fit. So it's really... It's really interesting. I mean, it's a very crazy phenomenon. So we're, this is a very interesting time. And, you know, I'm actually glad that I'm, old, I'm, I'm still alive to kind of go through this transition because we're really moving. This is like, I look at the COVID thing. When this started, this is really the, we're moving into the Jetsons now. This is the time we've always thought we're, this is Jetson. Everything is remote, virtual, driverless cars are now going to be more important. You're seeing cars take over the delivery systems. You know, everything is just completely shifting and it. The COVID thing forced it. It basically took five years and pushed it into, you know, five months. Right. It's wild, man. This is a wild time. So for me, I, I, I it's enjoyable to look at 
but you know, the human condition is all I care about. It's that's got to change. The only thing that's going to wake up is waking up. People have to wake up consciously. And uh, because to use moral, to use hate, use a moral issue and be able to use hate to, to defend that moral issue. It does, it's, it, it's, it's insanity. It, yeah. You it just, all day long. You're you going to get all day long. Yeah. You're going to get the same thing in return. And yeah. to your point, you know, all the censorship on Facebook, oh. it, it blows my mind that anything that needs to be talked about, they will pull it and they will ban it. But yet I will get these fake accounts that are bots adding me that are like literally profiles of porn yeah. that is accessible to children. And when I report it to get it removed, they say there's nothing wrong with it. And they tell me they did nothing about it. I know. I mean, it's absurd. I mean, if you really look at it and you look at where society is going, this is why it's the insanity and stuff. And, you know, I, I just look at some of this music. I mean, I don't know. I don't mean to be a, maybe I'm old or something, but I just don't see the value in what Cardi B's new song is. No, I don't. Just imagine those kind of words and that kind of messaging going out to kids today and stuff. And people will defend that all day long. And I'm like, really, is that what you want to teach the kids? Is that really what you want to do? Right. Really? I mean, it's, is that really value? I mean, is that really, is that really being, you know, helping the planet wake up to being kind and grateful and stuff to hear that kind of talking and then to call everybody a racist and da -da -da. Right. Is it because like, it's like, Oh my God, what are we doing? It's like, what's going on? If that's really the thing, could you imagine? I can't even imagine, you know, I mean, I remember the days, you know, it was like, you know, all those wholesome shows and things and people and about the kids and being careful about the things we're seeing. And now it's just like, you know, anything goes, but really what's happening. And this is really at the highest level, the myths of society are breaking down. Yeah. What I mean by that is the great religions, the great, the great things that people believed in, because those are the things that brought people together. The family, you're seeing how all of a sudden the, all the religious things are getting knocked down. They're, they're not, it's not good. Faith is bad. And, you know, these people that are like us, and, and, and I'm not saying there's not goofy things in that, but there is a sense of community around those and a, a sense of, of faith that was so important okay to how societies run. And when, when that goes away, it's like, we're moving into Roman Caligula times. Like, it's like party on, everybody do what you want to do. It's, it's free, except don't do what I don't, which you, what I don't tell you. You, you can't you only do what I say, right. it's free, but you can't, but you know, it's insane, right? It's, it's, it's really insanity. And it's, it's wild to see that that stuff is getting so accessible and, and, you know, even just the fact is, you know, they're, they're jumping down. And, you know, you look at the one side screaming about, you know, what Trump said, right? All that stuff that he said back. And then you got Cardi B having an interview with the president of the running president of the United States after her record drops on one of the most controversial things I've seen in a long time, right? And you're like, what are we doing to society, right? It's crazy. And, and, and I'm not judging, I mean, because like I said, I'm all like, hey, it is what yeah, it is. Right. It's happening the way it's supposed to happen. Right. If you stand back, if you become a watcher like me, I'm a watcher. I'm just like intrigued by the human condition. And I'm like, wow, this is crazy stuff right now. Crazy and, stuff. Yeah. And to your point, yet again, I mean, you talk about religion, things of that nature, faith being something that uh, brings people together. The first thing they do is they abolish it from schools. They take it out of schools. Well, yeah, it's crazy. It's this whole thing, because if you look at it, if you actually look, I mean, in communities, when there's disasters, those organ churches and organizations, they rally people together and they do that. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm like, you know, I, I, I'm not any kind of religious thing. I mean, I see that there's a lot of crazy stuff in religion, too, in, in that. So I'm not defending part of it, but it's that faith that brings people together. And those people that they do such good work, so many of them, when there's disasters, they step up and they get out as a community, that part of it. And not they're all perfect because they're all, they believe, but it's that bonding. And we're seeing that being completely taken over now. It's like, you know, the dark forces, you know, we call them kind of the, 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 the satanic forces that are starting to happen. It's fascinating. I mean, it's, it's really interesting. It's just really a good and evil thing we're going through right now. So it's going to be inter interesting to see how we, un how this whole thing unpacks over the next couple of years, for sure.
I agree. And, you know, I often say, and I know it'll never happen, but I often wonder, I'm like, what if, what do you think would happen if the majority of a country just did shrooms one day? <laughs> you know what I mean? Who like, knows? For a couple days or something, just figure just it like, out. Wake up! <laughs> you know what I mean? Because it changes your perception of things. Yeah, it can. Yeah, and no question. You're just kind of like, oh, none of this bullshit matters. No. Like, right. what I do matters. That's it. You know, that's it. That's all I can be accountable for and just yep. do what's right. Yep. So, my brother, this has been a really fun talk. Uh, we yeah. got on to my favorite subject, which I always try to do no matter <laughs> what, because I want people to wake up. Damn wake straight. Up. Get that inward journey, man. You'll be the <laughs> happiest thing. There's nothing better. It's the holy grail. I could go on forever about that. I yeah, mean, yep. so interesting. Yeah. So anyway, I loved having this conversation. Um, yeah. I am fortunately I have a I have a call right now that I'm a I am running a business, so I've got to jump on Absolutely. my business call. <laughs> so um, I'm really thankful to have be on here. I hope to see you in Quebec City here coming up. Oh right yeah, in, uh, December, Matt. Please come down. Let's hang. We'll yep. have a blast. Um, you know, if you can come down for a day or two, we're gonna also we're gonna be there. And we're only we're working Thursday, Friday, Saturday, but Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, we're gonna be looking for some club gigs or places we can play or hang out and stuff. So try to set it up to come come to our show and maybe come a day or hang out with us. You know, we'll be doing some fun stuff. Yeah. Sounds great, man. I'll probably stay a few days and just kind of hang. There you go. Party. Yeah. Right. Well, why not? And then I got a bodyguard. I got an M. I got a, I got a right. I'm 6'5", you know, 265. So I, I think people okay. usually think twice before. Uh, yeah, good, good. Especially yeah. an MMA guy, right? They right. don't want to mess with you. My, my shoes are size 14. No one wants that up their ass, man. So no, no. There you go. <laughs> all right. Well, excellent. Keith, man, it was an honor. Thank oh. you very, very much for having me and all your your folks out there. Hello, nice to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> it was an honor having you, man. Right, it, uh, thanks again. All right, take care. You too. All right. Don't work too hard. <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> All right, bye. Have a good one, man. Thanks for checking out the show. That was Scott Page. He's awesome. And uh, there's plenty more awesome guests coming. I got Stephen Perkins, and I've got Kenny Lee Lewis of you know some pretty legendary bands um including the steve miller band i got so much going on bro so feel free to check out anyone that you enjoy their uh legendary music career if you want to hear what they have to say check out the show feel free to listen to it and uh um i'm also going to be introducing at some point my twitch channel where I'll be doing some of these shows live so you guys in real time can ask questions and uh, say hi to the people that you admire. So thanks for checking us out, man. I'll catch your asses later.